Hi there, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sarah from Myosh. Um, today's topic is going is we're covering um, smart inspections and how to configure smart inspections to work for you. Um, before I introduce presenters, um, just let you know that the question panel down below is for where you can enter um, questions via text. If you want to chat to me directly, please use the chat panel or any panelists. Um, the presentation today, as with all our presentations, is being recorded recorded and we will send out an email with a video link and a podcast later today. I'll also drop a link in the chat um, where you can um, fill out a form to get some more information on smart inspections. Um, so today's um, presentation has been um, presented by Nigel Woodward and Adrian Manessas at Myosh. Over to you guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, okay, so what we're looking at just on the screen at the moment, uh, split screen, over on the right-hand side is the administration section. Over on the left, at the moment, you're looking at a video that I'm gonna show you in a moment, and behind that is the actual user view. Now, the focus of this is smart inspections. So before we even start, I think it's important to ask the question of what makes an inspection smart in the first place. And it has to be more than just making it convenient to do an inspection. But really, if that's all you're doing, what you're doing is replacing or replicating paper-based procedures. And even if you can send a notification to someone to say that an inspection has been completed, which obviously Myosh can, the person to whom you send that inspection uh, notification has to decide what to do after they review your inspection. So they've got to open up your inspection, have a look at the questions that you've answered, and then make a value judgment about whether or not they should do something about the fact that you said no to a particular question. So what you really want to do is remove the decision making from the person who's even doing the inspection. Uh, it means you can take a standard inspection with standard questions. They answer the questions. They have no idea whether or not the question they're answering is related to a critical risk or a non-conformance or anything else. And you also remove it from the person who gets notified that the inspection the inspection's been completed. So what you're doing is you're causing things to happen in the background as a result of answering the questions or completing values in fields in the inspection. So I, I think what we now have and what I would call it is end-to-end -end smarts in our inspections because what we have in addition to the functionality inside the actual inspection is additional functionality that makes it easier for you to create the inspection in the first place as well as the ability to extract inspections at the end of the process. So a use case for that might be that you've done a whole host of inspections. You've got a client who wants to actually see what your inspections are. You don't want to give that person access to Myosh, but you'd like to send them 100 inspections to prove that you did them. You need to be able to do that without having to go into each inspection and exporting them individually. So we'll have a look at this functionality first before we look at the inspection itself. Now the creation of the inspection, these are, and the export, these are things called add-ons. Uh, it's new functionality, it's being added. Uh, some of them are not quite ready, they're, they're being tested. Uh, we haven't put a price on these things at the moment, but they are coming. We'll have a look at the video and as we move through the video, I'll just chat about what actually is going to happen. So you're going to select one of these add-ons, the, the add-ons called Inspection Form Loader. And you can see here, there's an opportunity to get a template out of the form loader. So what this does is extracts an Excel spreadsheet for you to complete. Now, if we have a look at the spreadsheet, what you're effectively doing is you're saying what the sections are within the inspection you're going to create and what the questions are within the sections that you're going to create. 
And while we're looking at this, it's worthwhile looking over here at how you would go about doing this manually. So in the inspections module over here in the administration section, I'll just drag this over a little bit. What we've got is something that's really quite useful. We have something called a master inspection template. So if you wanted to create a new inspection, what you'd do is you'd highlight the master inspection template. And then what you'd do is you'd click on clone the form up here. What that then does is it copies the details of the master inspection template into something called copy of master inspection template. Then you open that up. And when you open it up, what you see is the details that have been copied. So there would be a section with some standard details in here. Then there'd be a stub, a stub question area where there's just one question. And what you would then have to do is generate the questions one at a time. Now, most of you who are going to create an inspection, you know what these questions are up front. And effectively, what you're doing is you're transcribing them from some Word document and putting them in here one at a time. And while it's convenient to have a master inspection template that you can copy, it still takes time. So if we go back to our video over here, what we've now done is we've created an Excel spreadsheet. And what you can do is wherever those questions are, you can just paste them into the Excel spreadsheet. You can see here that in the comments column, things like where you put a yes, what that does is makes comments available in that particular question. You might have a question here where you just don't think you need a comment. So you put a no, and what it means is that when you run the inspection later, there won't be the comments section. Over here, you can say, well, what kind of link records do I want associated with each question? And typically in just about every inspection that I've seen, actions are the things that you want to raise, but you could raise a hazard if you wanted to against a particular question. And then you've got the scores. What kind of answers do you want? Yes, no, not applicable, and what those scores are. And potentially you might have some different answers that you could assign scores to. So if we move on, what we're now going to do is we're going to use the inspection loader to take the, the Excel spreadsheet that we've completed and upload it. But before we do that, we're going to say what the name of this new inspection is. So give it a name. We obviously, we can choose the inspections module. You might have the audits module, something like that. Then it says, what do we want to clone? So this is now going to do that manual process of cloning the master inspection template into another document or record. And it says here, insert the questions after a particular section. So when you get hold of the master inspection template and you open it up, it knows that there's a details section in the master inspection template. And it's effectively saying, I wanna add these questions after that section, which is where it is by default anyway, but you could choose where to put it. Then you add or you put, drag and drop your Excel spreadsheet into the form. You click next, and what it does is it runs a check to see whether or not all of the records that you've put into that Excel spreadsheet, all the, the rows, are actually correct. Once you click next, it clones the form, the master inspection template. And then it moves all the records or the rows in your Excel spreadsheet into that cloned inspection and you go to inspections you drop down on the list and your new inspection that you have just created automatically is available for you to actually create a new inspection from that's a heck of a lot easier than going into the master inspection manually cloning it and adding every question one at a time now you can of course go back into the design if for example you wanted 
this question to only appear as a result of answering no to the first question, you could go into the inspection design and you could add to what you've done automatically. But this speeds up the creation of an inspection dramatically. So I'll just move that out the way for now. And what we'll now look at is the other end of the equation, which is extracting the information. So I mentioned earlier, you might have a client who needs to see an awful lot of your inspections. And what you can then do is you can go to another add-on called Exporter. Now, what Exporter does is it enables you to create a zip file containing the inspections that you filtered on. It takes all of the individual records, puts them into PDF format, and sticks them in a zip file, which you can then send to somebody. So it's pretty straightforward. You click on Export. It does the export for you. And if it's a big file, if you've chosen sort of 200 records, uh, there is a limit on how many records you can export with this. I think it's around about 800. Uh, but if it's taking a while, you don't have to sit here and watch it. You can go off and do other things. You can click download. And what that does is open up a zip file. All of the records are here in PDF format, and you can go and look at them. Something to note there is that uh, export function or export a bulk exporter function can also be used in other modules as well. So there's quite a few different use cases there. So you might want to, as Nigel said, you might want to export it, a list of inspections for a customer that you're you're doing work for. Um, but you could use it in other places. They may want incidents or hazards or um, even things like a situation where you need to export a lot of injury management documents out of the system um, for a potentially for a court case or something like that. Thank you, Nigel. Thanks. Sorry, I'm just going to get this out of the way. OK, so what we're going to do now is we're going to actually go and have a look at an inspection. I'm going to get rid of that. Uh, we're not actually going to use the phone today, but we'll just have a look at it to show that the pretty pictures that I can create as an administrator actually appear on the phone and what they look at look like. What I've created here is not really an inspection that you'd create. Uh, this is just a series of fairly random questions, but they're here to illustrate a point. OK, so what are the kinds of things that you can do in inspections to make them smart? Well, we'll talk about this one. This is something that potentially you would probably need to be uh, looking at the custom version. But what you're able to do is you're able to select in this case, a piece of equipment, maybe a vehicle, and put in the current kilometers. And when you submit the inspection, what it will do is it will update the current kilometers on the vehicle that you're inspecting. Now, the obvious use case for that is um, a pre-operational start. Every time you go in and inspect the vehicle, there could be a, a field in there that says, what's the current kilometers? You shove that in. Once you submit, notifications and whatever you've configured go out, but also the vehicle document gets updated with the current kilometers. If we scroll a bit further down, what we've got here are some graphics. 
And of course, as an administrator, you can add these graphics into the system so that when you're going to go and investigate something or review something, you actually know what the context is and you can compare what you're looking at to what you're supposed to see. So if we select no on this, what we can also do is we can make things mandatory. So you can see down here, now that I've clicked no, what it's done is it's opened up the section below and I can see an asterisk against the observation. What that's done is it's made the observation mandatory before I can submit this document. I can also make attachments mandatory and I can force people also to create a new, an action out of the inspection as a result of answering no. If I click yes, I'm not forced to do anything, but I can do. So if we scroll a bit further down, we've got some more photographs. You can see the range of pictures that you can put in. And of course, what you can do down here is you can put in nested questions. So it's fairly simple arrangements in the administration to set up nested questions. If I click no, another question opens up, then I've got options here. I can choose one of these. So I've chosen 1,000 to 33,000 volts. I've got distance over overhead power lines as three. If I choose something bigger, I get a different graph, a different picture. And what I can also do is I can set notifications up as push notifications. Now, this is part of what you currently have as an administrator. You can set up notifications based on answers to questions within inspections that go to certain people within the organization, either as an email or as a push notification or both. So what we've done is we've answered no to a couple of questions. Uh, in particular, we've answered no to this one at the top and followed it up with a no to can it be reset? And what we're going to do is we're going to complete that inspection. So mandatory field. Useful to see, you can't can't just submit things without completing mandatory fields. It forces you to submit them. So what we said before was that what makes things smarter and even smarter is if you were to take inspections, uh, which now has these end-to-end add-ons, if you were to take inspections and add in, say, the rules engine, this makes it smarter still. Because instead of just sending notifications or just sending emails where people have to do something, you can actually create things in the background that then are documents in their own right and have their own notifications built into them. And what I've done as a result of creating, uh, of answering no to that question about the freezer, is I've created a non conformance report. So this has the rules engine that sits behind this has actually generated a non-conformance report. And the generation of the non-conformance report itself has notifications built into it, which would be fired off because the non-conformance got, got created in the first place. So what's happened here is as a person answering this question on this inspection, I had absolutely no idea that a non-conformance was going to be generated. I didn't have to know. I had, didn't have to make any judgments whatsoever. I just answered the question. And what it's done is it's created a non-conformance with date fields created. It's put in a brief description. It's put in an immediate action. It's, it's been configured to fill in a lot of the standard fields that you would be putting in if you were investigating this from the beginning. And then of course, a notification will go out to somebody saying you've been assigned to deal with this non-conformance report and they can take it up as though somebody had created it and sent to them, which in effect, in effect by proxy doing the inspection they have. Now, 
I guess the ultimate in currently anyway, in creating things in the background is the critical control management. Because what you're doing there is you're updating not only a risk, you're updating controls within a risk and you're creating verifications about the fact that you're looking at the controls to a particular risk. So for those of you who were at the webinar a couple of weeks back um, with Josh Bryant from Mitchell's, you would have seen that we had a look at the tire and rim failure. Now, Josh explained a lot about why you would want to do critical risk in the first place. What I'm going to show you just very briefly anyway, is more of the functionality in MIOSH and how it works. So what we're looking at when we look at a critical risk is we're looking at all of the controls that have been built around that particular risk, and there could be multiples of them. And if we go in and we have a look at a particular control, <clears throat> Controls contain a lot of information. They, they have multiple sections, information about functionality, availability. And these are all sorts of things that you would have to add into a critical control a long time before you actually implemented the risk module. There's a fair amount of work that you would have to do in order to identify the risks in your business and the controls associated with those risks. But that said, if we go to the inspections module again, what we're doing is we're looking at a different kind of inspection. And again, what we're using is the risk engine to take inputs from the inspection and produce outputs that are actually documents in another module. So the outputs from the risk engine can be completely new documents. They can be changes to existing documents. So what we're doing in the light vehicle inspection, when we select no to this question over here about wheel nuts, is we are now saying, OK, there is a risk that is associated with wheel nuts. And what we're going to do is we're going to update that risk and we're going to set it to uncontrolled. There is a control associated with that risk and we're going to set that to not controlled. And what we're also going to do is we're going to create new verification documents to say that we actually did this check. And all of this happens in the background. And you can see here that this might be an inspection that people already have. They don't have to make any value judgments about whether or not this is associated with a critical risk. They just answer the question. So we'll click on completed. And we'll go back to critical controls. And what we can see is that the critical risk for tire and rim failure has been set to not controlled. Now, of course, because it's been set to not controlled, notifications will have gone out. Whoever is likely to get the, the notification can click on the link. When they click on the link, they can go in and have a look at all of the controls related to this critical risk, and they can see which control has been set to not effective. And this is all because in the background, the rules engine has been configured to update these documents. What it's also doing is it's adding in a control history which actually gives me a link back to the inspection where the control was identified as not being effective. So I'm able to click on that link and go and look at that inspection as well. 
What I can also do, because it generates these things all of the time, is I can go and have a look at all of the verifications for any control that has been created as a result of people doing inspections. And you can see down the bottom, there's over 1300 of them. So if I wanna know that a particular control has been verified on an ongoing basis, I can say, well, let's go and find, uh, let's choose one of these. There's a pressure relief valve. So I might wanna see which ones have failed. So now I can see what controls have failed at any time as a result of people doing inspections who knew nothing about the fact that this was even linked into the critical control management module in the first place. The other thing on top of that is it can give you a lot more information. So it might be telling you the site that it occurred on. It might be telling you the equipment or the asset number that it applied to, if that was relevant, um, the date that it was actually verified and checked. Yeah, just a matter um, of configuration. Exactly. It's just a matter of what, what it is you want to include in those verifications. And the same for anything else that the system generates, whether it's non-conformance or an action or even an incident for that matter. Right, Sarah, that's uh, about the end of what I've got to say. I don't know if, Adrian, you have anything further to add. Otherwise, we can just take some questions. I think um, maybe just in summary is, and I think Nigel put it quite nicely, but essentially most inspections up to date um, are, are pretty much just trying to reproduce what paper does. So you fill out a piece of paper or an electronic form and you tick yes, no, safe, unsafe, or whatever the answers are. But what they haven't done up until date, up to, up to date, is automate all the processes in the background that you might want to occur or that you want to occur as a result of questions being answered in the inspection. So what we're doing now is we're, we're making full use of the computer. So as opposed to just saying, here's a piece of paper, let's just try to reproduce what paper does. We're now saying, let's produce a fully integrated process that triggers all sorts of things that you define up front and you plan up front as opposed to relying on the people actually doing the inspections or the person that they send the inspection to. So what I've seen in a lot of cases, you've got piles of inspections that have been completed and they're just sitting there and people don't really know whether there's a major issue or not until they've actually gone and, and reviewed the inspections. So this adds a timely response as well. So things happen immediately um, and things happen. It saves a lot of time. So that non-conformance document that Nigel created, that was done in the background. So someone didn't have to manually type all that. It was just done automatically. And then the person assigned it gets it and actions it. So what it's doing is it's taking, it's, it's using the power of the computer with integration to make sure that everything happens straight away. Um, so processes occur and they don't get overlooked. Okay, thank you, Adrian. Um, I'd like to invite any questions in the Q&A panel, um, if you have any. Um, I've also dropped a link to a form in the chat panel if you want to um, share that information or um, add your details there to um, perhaps arrange a demo or ask some questions. Um, so we don't have any questions at the moment, Adrian and Nigel. Um, as I said earlier, we'll send the video out later today. Oops, every time I say there's no questions, there is a question. Um, okay, so Ashley is asking, how does this integrate to other existing systems and databases? Uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll answer that one. Um, so it, it can do. Um, so basically, if you've got the rules engine defined, um, other systems like maintenance systems or any other system, if a document gets pushed into the system through an API, then the same rules engine actually applies. So um, let's say giving the give the example of say the risk uh, the critical risk module so let's say in a maintenance system you actually picked up that there was an issue with worn tires when it shouldn't have happened and it was relating to a critical risk so with our apis what the maintenance system could do is automatically create a record 
within the MIOS system, which then could generate or trigger rules that then create all the different actions. So it might uh, make the critical risk uh, um, change to uh, not controlled. Uh, it might send off notifications. It might create other non-conformances or other actions. So basically, you would use our APIs with other systems to be able to then um, do that particular automation. And that can extend through to even things like sensors um, and those sorts of things. So um, it's, it's really just a matter of consuming our API. Our APIs are very, very well developed um, and um, also very, very well documented. Um, so typically an IT person um, in the other system would consume or use our APIs to then do that integration. I think it's worth making the point that that's a custom feature as well. Rather than that's right. So it's, you, you'd be doing that in, in the custom slash enterprise versions of our product. Ashley also said, great, so it can integrate with SAP slash F for Fiori. Yeah, absolutely. And we, um, we, we actively integrate with many, many products. Um, I'm not familiar with Fury, but I'm certainly SAP is a common one that we do. Um, but we typically don't find many products that we can't integrate with as long as they can consume APIs, which almost all products can do these days. Um, then we can um, basically uh, have integration being done. So um, it's extremely rare that you can't do integration. So it'd be It'd be extremely old products that couldn't do it. Um, anything in the last, uh, you know, 10 years should be able to do integration. Great. Okay. Um, Ashley's also brought this up and also Mark. Um, what about live data visualisation capabilities and charts? Yep. So the information, um, Nigel didn't really show this, but the information that's being generated is being pushed into um, a dashboard. And that dashboard can produce um, all sorts of charts um, and visualizations to, to show the data. So in the case uh, with Nigel, he was showing that it was producing verifications. Now it's important to realize that those verifications you would actually create whether it passed or failed on the question. So that's why there's so many in there. Um, but to, to look at that visually, you'd go to your dashboard and you, you can configure um, you can configure basically um, widgets that basically show you the, the passes and the fails or whatever it is you want to graph. Um, the other thing it can do is it can also integrate with um, third party. Um, in fact, I think Nigel's going there now. So it, it can also integrate with other third party um, uh, uh, you know, business intelligence tools as well. So, uh, but in, in, this particular case, in this particular case, it's actually using our native dashboard and um, demonstrating um, control failures um, in this particular case, um, fails and passes, and, and there's a whole series of other things. So, um, yeah, basically you can visualize the data in a variety of different ways. You could use our standard dashboard or you could use um, Viking Analytics, which, is a, um, which gives you more advanced visualizations. Um, or you could use uh, other business intelligence tools as well. Okay, great. Um, okay, another question. What about operational data systems? Can it bring through that data, e.g. processing real-time data? Yep, so again, that's just through the API. So um, if there's other uh, operational data systems, that's, uh, um, it can bring through that data, um, or that data can, be, it can either be pushed into it or it can be pulled back the other way. Okay. Well, that's all the questions for now. Um, and uh, unless we get another one, um, that was great. As I said, we'll send a recording out later and a um, podcast as well. So um, uh, thank you, Nigel. Thank you, Adrian. Hang on. There's another question. Um, could the rules engine be used to push a new control measure identified on a risk assessment or site risk register? to a control verification document. This way, when new or additional controls are identified, personnel don't need to manually update the inspection verification document. Yeah, in, in short, yes. Um, so the, the rules engine can be used to create new documents in other modules. 
um, or it can be used to update existing documents. So if you wanted to configure it to actually grab information from that inspection, from the comments that they'd placed there, um, in, most, in most situations there, you'd probably want someone to actually review it in that particular case, um, depending upon, uh, so if they suggested a new control, um, it could automatically create that control in the, uh, in the risk, uh, critical risk module. Um, or it could create any other sort of document. Um, and you can specify what fields you want it to be populated in that document and what status you want that document to be at. So you could get it, so it put it in there as a draft or a pending review, and then you could have it email someone automatically to review it to make sure that it was okay and then um, change the status to you know, uh, operational or, or active or whatever you want it to be. So... Yep, the, the answer to that is um, basically yes. Okay, um, and um, someone wants to know, what's the best way for me to under, fully understand the full suite of modules from my OSHA? I'm looking at a fully, safe, fully integrated safety management system solution. Um, yep, basically contact us. Um, we're always happy to organise specific demonstrations um, where we can go through your um, particular use cases and understand what it is you're trying to achieve and the modules that you want to see. Um, so we have a very, very large number of modules. Um, it's a matter of working out which modules um, that you'd like to see. And with the Viking platform, it's also fully configurable that you can actually have modules developed very, very quickly. And if you've done the advanced training, you can even build um, your own forms and modules as well um, with your own specific uh, fields, workflows, security, um, also integrated with dashboard. So um, we've got a lot we can show you with what we've done, but there's also things, you can also bring things to us and say, well, we've got this spreadsheet that we've been doing in our business. It's been manual. It's causing us problems because um, someone created it a long time ago. We don't know how to change it or um, it's manual and the security is not great or we can't get reports out of it or it has to be emailed around or whatever it might be. When you've got that situation, you can actually have Viking create those you can create those forms within Viking and then build in all the security, all the workflows, all the notifications. Um, but yep, getting back to your question, um, more than um, one of our team members will be more than happy to go through and demonstrate um, any of the functionality that you want to see. Yes, and as a follow-up to that, we can provide you with a sandbox. And once you've had the demo, you'll have a good idea of how to use the product and you can just play around with it to your heart's content. Yep. And Sarah can get your contact details and um, and one of our team can make contact with you. Great. Okay, we'll do that. Um, so that's it for the questions. Um, every time I say that, we get another one. But um, All right. No, I think that's it. And any questions, you know, you can also um, email um, me directly as well. Um, so that's it for this morning. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Nigel. That's really good. And see everyone next week. Thanks. Thanks very much. Cheerio. Thanks. Bye. Mm -hmm.